Welcome back to the Improvisation as a Space for Experience Conference, Erfahrungsraum Improvisation. And so now we are reuniting here after the break to talk uh, together about our insights um, into what improvisation can mean and what its potentials are for personal experience, but also what an impact this can have on a broader scale. Grammy Wilson could not stay for the panel, unfortunately, but I'm happy to welcome again Guru Gravim Johansen, Raymond McDonald, Laura Navarro Ramon, Simon Rose, and Eva Siliamecki, and I'm Matthias Maschert from Exploratorium Berlin. It's probably uh, more or less impossible to give a short summary of what we have heard from you today already in your presentations. I can say that it was very dense and that there were so many aspects in it crucial for improvisational experiences. And this is also where I would like to start uh, with our discussion now. You all share the practical experience of improvisation as well as the experience of researching on improvisation and what also connects you in a special way is that you have all been doing field studies it's all based in ethnographic work uh, it's all empirically gained knowledge in a way and yeah after all of this, the presentations this morning i'm now very interested what you have discovered in each other's presentations um, what also feeds back in your own research where do you see common ground concerning the potential of improvisation, the meaning of improvisation, and so on. And you also uh, can, of course, point at things where you may have come to different conclusions or different observations. Um, yeah, and if you want to contribute, just wave your hand. Where to start? <laughs> I'm uh, I'll jump in. Um, I'm working on a book at the moment about transdisciplinary improvisation, and I'm certainly going to look be looking up um, Guro's um, book, um, expanding the space uh, for improvisation in in pedagogy, and um, for one thing, I don't know if you could say more a little bit more about that that book. Oh, thank you for the challenge. Yes, I can. I want to say, actually, to begin with, that um, uh, informing the initial idea for that book, Eva, here was a significant part. I think she was the one uh, suggesting that we use the term transdisciplinary. And then for various reasons, Eva have to, had to pull out of the work. So um, the four of us, um, except Eva uh, carried out the book. So just to have said that, you, Eva is also part of it. But um, the idea of the book as such was to, uh, to, to try to gather very different, different uh, perspectives from different fields uh, and different levels, if that, if that is a word that makes sense, you know. So, so we cover, uh, the articles cover working with preschool children and it covers uh, working with it in uh, higher education um, as well as community music. Uh, and it's, there, there is a slight bias in the book in the sense that it's, it's very European dominated. Uh, there is one contribution from, from Japan uh, and, the, and one contribution from an, no, <laughs> I'm mistaken. Yeah, so uh, a sh part of a chapter from the Middle East, uh, and the, the problem with with uh, such a sparse representation from you know cultures that it's easy to think of as other, you know, the other with a capital O, is that they it's easy that they become represent representatives. So, but the the intention was to to cover broadly. Uh, and to see, I don't know, from my, per, I'm not going to, to ascribe this position to the other editors, but my own 
position is that I'm interested in difference. I noticed that many um, scholars within improvisation uh, research uh, looks like that they seem to, to look for uh, commonalities and common uh, common experiences and, and that is of, of course important in its own right but there is a danger that we neglect differences and if we do that there's also a, a danger that we uh, oversimplify experiences uh, so I don't know if that was a very long answer and not very pointed I'm sorry for that but but uh, I, yeah, that's a point I want to make. I'm 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 interested in difference, uh, and in in point. What's the difference between something that is experienced as successful and something that's not? If we if we talk about improvisation as it's it's uh, as only a positive glorified thing, then we are overlooking and maybe ignoring and maybe excluding some some voices, and the same goes for improvisation in different traditions as, as my own presentation wanted to address the importance of culture and tradition. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Okay. Eva? Yes. Um, now that I had time to think during Guru's <laughs> wonderful answer <laughs> um, about uh, I feel about this this presentation. I feel that, like I said a little bit earlier already, that there's so much similarities in our studies. For inst instance, mentions of uh, Christopher Small and Etienne Wenger, and kind of like this social cultural understanding of learning and the social aspect. That um, for myself, this was brought in through my initial kind of jump into uh, improvisational music or music improvisation was through improvised theater. So kind of my basis is already transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, which, which word we, we use. But um, kind of I've always noticed this difference between uh, how how music can be improvised with a focus solely on the music on the sounds interacting and then there's quite a really big array array of uh, possibilities keeping your eyes closed or open and then when you open the eyes uh, you see the other one and then kind of improvisational theater uh, brings much uh, help in how to improvise when you have your eyes opened, how to think this, this improvisational and social attitude, which I write about also in my dissertation, which is about much, I feel like this combination of our studies here is about the social participation in improvisation and that kind of like coming to that this transdisciplinarity is already there just that we kind of uh, find it and see it more so I feel that these silos of disciplinary silos can be very um, uh, creating boundaries that are perhaps uh, that they exist and of course, of course we overstep them but we have more similarities than we think with for instance with other arts it's just the more the attitude and the approach and realizing uh, how the social interaction in 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 anything that we do is always present and how I am here if I if I would be like talking like this to you all, all the time so it would be perhaps difficult for you to understand me but when I look straight into your eyes so these kind of things to be realized in and then of course uh, the visual part also kind of steps into this but now I'm starting to go somewhere but uh, this this also I have to mention this uh, shared understanding that Guru said earlier, because I think it's very 
important in this also because uh, it is kind of the same thing it, as with students that or or if we come from different disciplines that we have a shared understanding of something in that space we have a shared understandings perhaps that anybody can join in or anybody can leave at any time they want to or kind of these the shared understandings are much wider than the music they are much wider or when we understand music as social action they actually include are included in the music so i'm really thrilled about what i've been hearing today and we just need to write the next five books about this together that sounds a that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> uh, Laura. Well, uh, for me, this morning, since my <clears throat> perspective, were an incredible kaleidoscopic of many, many, not only transdisciplinary fields, if not both philosophical, psychological, educational. I think that uh, for me, in my field that is music education, my worries are how to translate, translate a less, a little in, in the reality of the classroom in, primary and secondary school and in music school uh, with children. Because I think that the German of uh, self-expression, the German of uh, enjoyment and playful through the music is uh, at, the, at the beginning of the musical experience. And uh, this morning, I learned a lot. <laughs> With my limitation of the of the understanding of English, I feel a little outdated because it's I always read in English, but I have not too much opportunities to talk in in English. But uh, I, um, in general, I understand that um, improvisation is more than a a space or a environment it's a, a space of possibility or expansive learning I, I like said guru a space for auto expression exploration discovery experience and I think that the most important is to connect the the children or the person that study with professionals, because sometimes there are uh, independent words. The um, impro professional improvisers and theories and philosophies are in different uh, in different um, space or context that the uh, teachers, professors, or students. And I think that. We have to build bridge and tend to connect. Yeah, what are the ideas to really um, reach current music education with our ideas about improvisation? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. right. Okay. On, you, on you go, Simon, on you go. No, I was just going to pick up on something Lara mentioned um, now, and also she mentioned it, reminded me, she mentioned it before the lunch break. And this business of, uh, we can call it translating these, some of these ideas into the practicalities of the classroom and the, the image and the story that she told of the teacher coming in from next door because one of the kids was on the piano and being very loud. And this, um, what, how can I sum it up? The, 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 the ability of people to be, to express themselves freely and to express what they need to express sometimes um, in a real and meaningful way. And it can be very playful 
um, and, and how that sits within constructs of education. And um, as I spoke about before, I was working with these permanently excluded, difficult teenagers. And um, uh, th this was something that was in the room. I had to sort of develop a culture in which people felt safe. And so we'd have in drama and music, there'd be a rule there was no physical contact. Um, because these are kids who would intimidate each other um, on a daily basis. <laughs> and, um, uh, and this kind of thing. And also nothing gets broken was another rule. And um, because things w would get broken if I didn't make that as a rule. So I'm just saying that these, th that's an extreme example, but nevertheless, Lara's more kind of general or, or generally applicable idea of, you know, you've, you've, if you, it, it, it's quite scary for a teacher to ask children to improvise freely. And I think, I, but I think that the, I mean, I've got ideas about that, but I think that's something that's very real if we're going to go, you know, if any or some of us go into schools and talk about improvisation, this is something that teachers face. And I, I guess it's, it's to do with the context. And then, and again, we, we have to go and we have to think of the bigger issues, the bigger, so we're teaching within the, you know, it's the, it's, for me, my, my answer to that question, if you like, would be it's to do with the context, that improvisation is always context specific. And it's to do with the relationships that we're building up in the room. And that's part of improvisation as well. But it's almost like that becomes foregrounded within the pedagogy in order that these things could become addressed so that there's a balance between sanity and safety <laughs> with children who need guidance and, and we are responsible. And a balance between that and for example, in the setting I was in, I was encouraging them to bring their own music in. I wasn't encouraging them to learn extended techniques on the saxophone. I was saying, yeah, I, I actually applied for money to get decks, to get microphones, so that could become part of the le learning cycle and then expand to other kinds of music. And that was equally, in my opinion, that was equally improvised. But, but you're so right to draw attention to the difficulties that improvisation, it's not as safe as kids sitting learning to read music, for example. We, we'll have Raymond and then Guru and then Eva, I think. Yeah, so I'm, I guess I'm just following on from what Simon was saying and also thinking about your question, Matthias, about improvisation in education and Guru's interest in different types of experience, not necessarily good experiences, because it's important to understand um, negative experiences as well. And I guess w one particular point, I think it's to say that, yeah, while I feel, what's the word, almost evangelical about improvisation, but not fundamentalist. I think it's possible to be evangelical, but not fundamental about Im improvisation, while acknowledging that improvisation in and of itself is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It's it's the context in which improvisation takes place and how how we work with improvisation, and particularly you know, in um, an educational context, because that's, that's what we're discussing right now. Um, and, and I guess that's one of the, the challenges for us as, as, as researchers, is to try and understand in more detail the processes and the outcomes of, of, of improvisation while celebrating its potential and celebrating the, the different ways in which it can be used, but without just assuming that because something is improvised or because a situation is improvised that it's necessarily going to be good. Um, and so to have, I think Guru said that earlier as well, to, to not oversimplify, to, to in some way celebrate the complexity and the messiness, and I use messiness in a theoretical sense as well, John Law's research around mess, sociological, psychological mess, to celebrate the complexity and the messiness of improvisatory situations, while at the same time being evangelical about, about its potential and, and about people's universal capacity for, for creativity and, and collaboration. I actually think, yeah, I think Eva was before me, so. Okay, then. Okay, yeah, a lot <laughs> to say here already. 
Uh, Lara and uh, Simon mentioned music education. And I think there's this kind of a paradigm shift that could be made where we realize that each lesson where we have musical education is related to the learner's well-being. That in each session we are making decisions that have to do also not just about just what they learn musically or what they do musically, but also is related to their well-being and their own identity is being constructed and their understanding of, of how they potentially in the future can make music or pe be part of music. And uh, I'm actually starting next year. Uh, uh, I got funding for three years to do a postdoctoral post project for which, in which I'm going to collaborate with a music teacher and I'm going to kind of feed in and explore with, with uh, her uh, improvisatory and improvisational uh, possibilities. And to that, we also come to what Simon said in the beginning about having to be an improviser as a teacher. So it is the improvisational attitude also to be brought into the musical class. And that, uh, we're going to explore how we could uh, make the school community a safer place, space through music education with the means of improvisation. So that how if this improvisational attitude could be planted in the school and I, thinking of starting with the curriculum, taking those things that are required and maybe molding them so that music education, which is an obligatory uh, uh, subject in Finnish schools, could become the place for musical inspiration and the place for well being and the place for learning to treat each other uh, in a respectful way. And in this way, if we could start from what the students. Uh, are and what they are able and what they can do and by kind of bringing them in through improvisational uh, means we could perhaps um, uh, create more equal and, and create equity in music education classrooms because at this moment those for instance who have uh, special needs in schools like my own uh, two, two <laughs> children have gone through music education and they couldn't play the drums because the teacher was always, well, you can't behave, so you can't play the drums. So in a way, realizing that music education is always involved with well-being, which also relates to what Laura said about this multidisciplinarity, not just in the arts, but in uh, all, all academic uh, disciplines as well as kind of this holistic environment we are in realizing that. So how can we make music education such play such place where it could be and play is also a wonderful uh, uh, concept for understanding learning through improvisation. Yeah long thing but I managed to say almost all <laughs> okay cool you want to continue yes thank you this um your mentioning of equity Eva uh, was a good transition to what I wanted to say um tying up with the uh, Laura's example of the the teacher who found the improvisation from the children disturbing uh, and, and also what Simon and Raymond commented on, that when we open up, if, if, we, if we use improvisation to open up for, you know, anything, everything is allowed, anything can happen. That means that also negative things are opened up to, um, whether it be uh, performers or musicians or children or pupils using that, space of freedom to bully each other um, 
Um, many of us know Una McClone from Glasgow who worked with preschool children and he, she saw that when they were given tools uh, to, uh, to, that was meant to structure improvisation, they used these tools to, to exclude each other <laughs> because they, they were given the freedom and the, and the scope uh, and now I'm reaching the point that I want, or the, uh, yeah, that I wanted to make, because there's something that Raymond mentioned in, in his talk earlier that we haven't really addressed, and that's the, he talked about wanting to challenge uh, hierarchies and meritocracies that we know. There's a, there's a trope about improvised music as this flat structured, very democratic kind of music, because there, there are no pre-described roles or um, yeah, set rules. Uh, but as I said, when we open, when we give freedom, that freedom can also be misused. So the question is, and the problem is how, because um, improvising together, as many of you all have addressed in your talks, uh, we don't know, always know what to do and we don't, always know what the other mean. And there's a lot of insecurity maybe uh, involved. And so addressing, if I feel in a band, for example, if I feel that another musician is trying to send me out, trying to, you know, um, uh, uh, be louder than me or, you know, doing something to exclude me musically, uh, we also have very, strong social norms that prevents us from, you know, addressing conflict or admitting, acknowledging conflict. So, so there's a potential for, <laughs> for informal, implicit hierarchies that emerge in a musical open setting. How do we address that? I think that's very difficult. Um, also other factors come in, for example, uh, gender, ethnicity, uh, age, uh, that um, makes us maybe uh, accept um, more from the white elder man than, for example, a black woman. And this, is, this is proven to be the case. So how do we deal with these things that can be delicate? Raymond and Eva, I think they were both at the same time. On you go, Eva. On you go, Eva. Okay. Yeah, but you are leaving soon, so if you. Okay. So uh, about these difficulties and and how this bullying and things, and I think they are the really interesting thing to discuss when practicing improvisation so collaborative improvisation um uh, what i do with my participants is that we stop and we, re we reflect on what we did and asking particular questions is how you experienced it how you felt what did you think and also directing it to the social context. So kind of keeping in mind and bringing about what, what, how did it feel and how it feels for the other person. So I think mm, what is, um, what I didn't have room to discuss in my dissertation is really this, this big verbal and nonverbal uh, interaction that is going on in a session with people and how and and, and uh, maybe I'm idealistic but I uh, I hope that if for instance <laughs> uh, we all could be learned in school kind of if the social em emotional capabilities and competence would be included in the in the education throughout our lives so we could perhaps start understanding them also but of course these difficulties still arise but yeah this was my thinking hmm. yeah. I'd like to chip in is it my is uh, it? I, 
If I jump uh, uh, okay. I think Raymond wanted to have something to say. Um. Well, oh. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was just thinking of, of I mean, G G Guru's point that, about, you know, the nature of some respect, the nature of freedom and, and, and improvisation and um, how children might behave when given com com complete freedom. But I think improvisation is a great site for learning about ethics and learning about um, understanding other people's perspective. And, and, and often when you give children freedom, to do this, they, they, they will you know, they will learn, and, and it becomes a place where you can where you can discuss discuss these issues very very explicitly. I think also, in terms of improvisation, often been seen as um, a process that challenges hegemonies and challenges um, hierarchies. There is no doubt that hierarchies always exist. And I'm saying that as, remember, the Glasgow Improvisers Orchestra for 20 years, where we've always tried to have, if you like, a, fl a flat structure. But there is no doubt that even if we don't have a president and a chairman and a secretary and, a, you know, a first violin and a second violin or whatever, there's a different sort of hierarchy that, that, that's there. You know, the hierarchy of who's been in the band the longest, the hierarchy of... And I think, as, as, as Guru points out as well, we have to be very careful of... I know I'm a middle-aged white man who's a professor, so that comes with, with, with an awful lot of hegemonic power, if you like. And so I've got to be aware... Regardless of whether I think I'm in a democratic organisation that doesn't have a leader, I've got to be aware of, 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 my, of, my, of my situation. And sometimes the only thing you can do... <laughs> The only thing you could do is stop talking. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do right now. <laughs> I'll pass over to Simon. Here's another white male. Um, <laughs> uh, we need another white male. <laughs> okay, we've well, got one, I suppose. Um, no, I just, I'm going to, like an echo chamber, Raymond, I'm sorry. It's, it, I think Cord Cornelius Cardew, who's a, who's an, who's an, some of you have heard of him. Some, he's an important figure in the development of um, what we can call free improvisation in, in London, in the UK scene. And I think, he's, he, I think the paraphrase would be something, what you play tells us what you have in mind. And um, going back to the example of the bullying, you know, I mean, it's, I, I suppose, leading off from the idea of Cardew, and um, the, we're talking about the ethics of improvisation, I suppose. And, um, you know, the musical and the social are really indivisible. And I think children understand bullying. Bullying is something that's discussed in schools a great deal um, from a very early age. And, um, um, and, and, you know, of course, I, I think it's a, it's a bit of a myth, actually, that suddenly there's this, there's this thing of free improvisation that suddenly appears in the room and everyone goes crazy. I, I'm not sure that's ever things really work in that way you know i'm never sure a teacher will communicate that sense to children but they will probably frame the session in a, in, a, in a way that any other you know in any any other kind of responsible and authoritative teacher will impart you know make as i referred to before safety in the room and these kind of things so um so that does reflect and again that this whole thing does reflect back onto the teaching process and also the ways in which the teacher is understanding their role as an improviser. And if somebody is, it looks like there is a sign of, impro of bullying within the music, how they as a teacher improvising are able to work with that in the room. Um, for example, I used to use video recording. In fact, the first study that I did focused on what it was about recording with video that helped the process work with children with emotional, behavioral, and social difficulties. And somehow that diffused the situation. And I realized that what I'd done, um, I formalized what I'd done. I hadn't realized, but what I was doing was I was very often giving the camera to very significant people within that peer group, within that power structure in the room. So if I got five boys and there's one girl, I maybe would give the camera to the girl in the room and then all of a sudden she's got 
some kind of control over the situation and what's taking place. So there are different ways, and certainly with instruments that can pan out. Of course, drums can be very loud, you know. So it's like just, just little things like that. But I certainly think, but like Raymond says, I mean, I think the improvisation can be the site in which these things also become manifest, become discussed, because there's an inversion of this, and it's something that... I would also argue, you know, like men with saxophones can be very loud. And I, and I know that I've been too loud in the past, you know, in certain situations. Foregrounded instrument, it's, a, well, it's got a history of being a foregrounded instrument and so on. But I think there's, there are also, it's much more complex than this because there's also, there can also be quite a, a pass, there can be a passive aggressive thing that goes on in music where you're like, Christ, I've, I've got to be able to hear this thing over here. And so you can get all kinds of inversions and, and, and um, different shapes and things happening in the interactions. So we'll have Laura next and then Eva. And I also wanted to say if somebody at Exploratorium would like to ask something, to comment on something, there's a microphone near the office door. You can just go there and get it if you want to. Um, but first, Laura and Eva. Well, as Simon talked, uh, I think it's really important, the power of free improvisation with children. Uh, according to my research, my research and empirical data, an environment where they feel that uh, there are no failure, probably a topic, but with children, it's another reality, educational reality, uh, no judgmental context, and uh, said uh, Eva, a place where you feel safe, psychologically safe, because uh, you can express. And um, more than that, uh, free improvisation allow in, well, in my experience, uh, children, for children to globalize and utilize, utilize uh, their own abilities and knowledge as in other kinds of uh, improvisation or instructions are not uh, so easy. Um, especially uh, free improvisation based on associations or metaphorical thinking have developed a um, powerful psychological experience based on a state of flow or uh, feedback, the feedback, the unimportant feedback. Uh, what I see as needed as teachers and facilitators, instructors and co-improvisers is um, the ability to read the situation. So while the focus can be on the music, it needs to be on the social context as well. And as a uh, 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 well, as has been many studies have uh, noted about how the teacher uh, perhaps has to uh, lose or give up of the authoritarian or authoritarian authority or so. So in that, how can we Mm. the teacher needs social emotional competence so that it's possible to read simultaneously these things in the atmosphere and I think that's very important for and could be more emphasized in in music educator training as well as of course improvising mm. I'm really happy that you all accepted my invitation, that we came here together. 
uh, anybody who is into these kind of questions and who's interested in reading about uh, all the questions who we've been discussing here today, I can really recommend to have a look into uh, the writing of our guests here today. It's very fascinating. Uh, thank you very much. Laura Navarro, Naramon, Raymond McDonald, Simon Rose, Eva Silja Mackey, and Guru Graben Johansson. And uh, once again, also to Gravy Wilson, who's not here anymore right now. Um, yeah, I hope to be in contact in the future. And thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye everyone. Bye.